Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, because I got a big one for you today. Make sure you're subscribed and let's just jump into it. We've got some crazy shit going down in Milwaukee. All right, so where we'll start is you got this guy, D'Angelo Wright. He's on a drive in Milwaukee. And all of a sudden, he sees something. He pulls over and decides he's going to intervene. With the thing going down being in the middle of the road, you had a 62-year-old white man grabbing a 24-year-old black man by the neck. With the 24-year-old's family saying that he's developmentally disabled. And so with all this going down, Wright takes out his phone and he records. Record. Let go of his neck. He's not going he Stole anywhere. the bike right out sir, of a friend of sir. mine's yard. Let go of his so the older man's on the phone with someone, possibly police, and as you heard, he claims the younger man stole his friend's bike. But then, seconds later, he appears to contradict himself, saying not the younger man, but the younger man's friend stole the bike. This kid over here, one of his friends stole a bike right out of a friend of mine's yard. Also, later adding that the stolen bike was green, but as you can see in the video, the other bike is blue. Not that necessarily any of those details are decisive in if this was okay or not. It's just important to add that context to this story. And actually, regarding getting more information, getting more answers, the police are now investigating the video. Right? It went viral, people sent it, it got their attention. You even see them confronting the man at his home, with also notably at least two protests being staged outside his residence, demanding that he get charged and accusing him of racism and vigilante justice. Some going as far as to even compare it to other cases of white men taking the law into their own hands, like the 2020 murder of Ahmaud Arbery. And while that obviously resulted in the loss of life, it, it is true that it, it does feel like we do live in a, a time where because people are recording, we're seeing different end results than we previously would. But as far as what happens here, we'll have to wait and see. And then, I'm starting in OnlyFans is not something I can say because I think my wife hates money and is not on board, but is something that Markiplier is saying right now. Mark, if you don't know, one of the most successful homegrown online creators. Really, it just has too many successes to list off. But um, on Monday, he announced to the world he will launch an OnlyFans if his podcasts go to the top of Spotify and Apple Music, which he claims will feature tasteful nudes, which if that doesn't translate to his uh, dick and balls wearing a top hat and monocle, I'm gonna be very disappointed, but the disappointment would still be measured because he says that all the proceeds would be donated to charity, which is a cool thing, but also one that makes sense. I, I saw him go on a podcast recently and he was like, yeah, it, it's really stupid how much money I have. All I ask is if he does actually launch this, we don't refer to it as Mark's OnlyFans, we refer to it as Mark's Dongs for Donos. Donos means donations. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep workshopping the Name. But with this announcement, Mark started to trend on Twitter, and then this whole situation became another thing. And it's something that gained a lot of traction in its own right, with one user tweeting, Markiplier defended PewDiePie's repeated anti-Semitism and anti-blackness, and I no longer feel comfortable supporting him. However, if you do, that is perfectly fine. Just know who you support. Good night. Right with that, alluding or rather referencing to the incident back in 2017, where Markiplier defended PewDiePie, who at the time had made comments that led to many labeling him as anti-Semitic and racist. And I want to be very clear about something. Felix is not an anti-Semite. And Felix does not advocate hate. And I'm not even defending the jokes that he made because even he has apologized for some of the jokes that he did. But he as a person, as an inherent human being, He's not these labels. Well, of course, with this, you had people going after Markiplier and PewDiePie and people defending Markiplier and PewDiePie. One of the defenses was very notable because they are PewDiePie's editor, who happens to be a black man jumping into the fold and responding. PewDiePie is so anti-black and racist that I'm still employed. All of this also resulting in a lot of people digitally groaning about this controversy, saying things like, this was five years ago, stop. As a victim of my past getting dug up and used against me, leave Markiplier alone, holy shit. As well as, ah, yes, a vid from five years ago and in recent times he has not done things with PewDiePie and and talk about him, as well as people really trying to say that Mark saying to not send death threats to PewDiePie five years ago makes him a bad person. Yeah, ultimately that is the situation as it is now, and of course with it, I'd love to know your thoughts. Also, this happened while I was recording today. Uh, it looks like Mark is launching that OnlyFans. Or another way to put it is that Mark Applier beat Joe Rogan with his dick. Fuck, that would be a really good title, but I would get sus- uh... And then Netflix is not dead. Or things haven't been looking great for Netflix. They lost nearly a million subscribers over the summer because of competition. They're laying off hundreds of employees. They were shutting down offices. Also, after years of even joking about people sharing passwords for Netflix accounts, the, the news came out that they were going to reportedly try and crack down on it. It was also rumored and later revealed that they're actually going to launch a cheaper ad-supported plan. That is actually going to be launching relatively soon. But the big news, Netflix announced they gained 2.4 million subscribers in their last quarter, which is a huge number on its own. But here's a key thing to remember. This is double what they actually expected they were going to get. And even when they said that they were 
going to gain 1.2 million subscribers. People were like, are you though? So this morning you had shares going up and it's going to be interesting to track this. Or what is the password sharing crackdown going to look like? What is the reception of the ad supported tier is going to be? How's that going to affect the business? Who knows? But what I will say is uh, with them being the blockbuster killer, I, I think they realize they can't just do nothing. And then I reclaim my time is not uh, just a statement that Katie Porter uses when she's dunking on tech and oil execs, but rather it's what tons of Americans have been doing over the last year or so. With new research showing that Americans who are now working from home have reclaimed 60 million hours of their life. But according to research by Stanford University professor Nick Bloom, about 15% of the workforce still works entirely remotely and 30% have a hybrid schedule, where a lot of the time being taken back are the commute times. Most everyone reportedly getting around an extra hour of sleep. Also using that time for, for different types of leisure, right? Watching stuff, playing stuff, playing with the kids, cleaning up. And while obviously not every job can be work from home, as someone who has fully embraced it at his company, I fucking love it. Like, yeah, there are some downsides, but the positives greatly outweigh those. And of course, because I like to make every story about me, when, you know, I had my, my health troubles earlier this year, it made me really think about, like, how every hour of my life that I have is incredibly valuable. And at minimum, I was losing an hour of day from a commute, if not more. Right, because that's an important thing to remember. Like, if you have a nine-to-five job, it's not really nine-to-five. It's all that prep time, all that commute time both ways. Then if it's a really draining job, it takes even more time to recover. And personally, I haven't found it to have made uh, anyone on my team less productive. But I also think that's because when there's less downtime, it's easier to be engaged and be high performing. Or they've mastered the art of bullshitting and I just haven't realized that things have gone downhill. Either way, pretty impressive. And then we might now know why some people are being eaten alive by mosquitoes and others not so much. And this thanks to a new study that's in Scientific American now that explained that they took 64 participants, had them wear nylon stockings on their arms, and after six hours the nylons were imbued with each person's unique smell. And while you and I might not be able to really smell the difference between either, apparently the mosquitoes could. And they found in this study that the mosquitoes were most attracted to people that put out more carboxylic acid. Humans produce these acids in our sebum, which is the oily layer that coats our skin. There, the acids help to keep our skin moisturized and protected. Humans release these at much higher levels than most animals, though the amount varies from person to person. Though, the researchers said, this is not definitive yet, saying the mosquitoes could also be attracted to the skin bacteria digesting the acids that we produce. And also adding, and this is good news or bad news depending on if mosquitoes like you or not, it appears that personal factors like, like changing the soap you use or changing how you eat had pretty much no impact when they tested the subjects again. Though, possibly good news if you are currently mosquito food, it is believed that the study could help create better mosquito repellents. And then, I want to take a second to thank today's sponsor, Keeps. Did you know that two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time that they're 35? Maybe you got that friend or that family member that's dealing with hair loss, and if you don't want to just wait around for that to happen to you, you don't have to. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair that you have, Keeps has you covered. Keeps helps you stop hair loss before it's too late with a scientific and affordable approach to treatments that are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. And in addition to clinically proven treatments, Keeps has an award-winning all-natural thickening shampoo and conditioner system. And you can get these products delivered directly to your door, meaning no more going in person to the doctor's office for your prescription, saving you both valuable time and money. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash DeFranco, or just click that link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. And then, are abortion rights actually the mobilizer that Democrats think they are? That is the million dollar question that's been up in the air ever since Roe v. Wade was overturned and now especially headed into the midterm. Right, so far, the topic has been a major mobilizer for Democrats online with conversations, with polling, but will that actually turn into votes headed into the midterms where historically the party that's in power loses votes? And as we've talked about before, even with the polling, right now it appears that Republicans are widely expected to retake the House this year. You know, we've seen Biden vowing that abortion legislation is a top priority next year, saying that the first bill he sends to Capitol Hill is going to be to codify Roe v. Wade. That is, if Democrats are able to control enough seats in Congress for that to even be possible. Something I saw one outlet saying is a worrying sign that voters even need to be reminded about. But regardless, abortion rights too many seem like the possible thing to tip things in their favor. And that includes people like Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin. She currently serves Michigan's 8th district, but she's running for the 7th because it includes much of the areas she represented before redistricting from the 2020 census. And a key thing here is that Slotkin was one of the only Democrats to win their congressional elections in districts that Trump won in 2020. And now this year, her race has been described as one of the most competitive in the entire country with her facing off against Republican State Senator Tom Barrett. And so to get a better idea of what's happening in general, but especially on a more local level, how is the race going what's on the line we've reached out to representative slotkin i think what's at stake especially in a place like michigan um is kind of just what is the direction we want our country to take what are the what is the way out of this extremely volatile moment in our history 
Um, and for me, um, I, I just am unwilling to accept that this, we may have seen the high water mark on our rights in this country. And like now we're just rolling backwards. And Slotkin also went on to note that abortion is literally on the ballot this fall in Michigan in the form of an initiative called Proposal 3. Right, Proposal 3, it would codify abortion protections and other reproductive rights in the state constitution and replace an existing law from 1931 that bans all abortions. And while Slotkin did note that her district generally identifies as pro-life and abortion has barely come up in her past elections, tons of people have been mobilized around the issue now that reproductive rights aren't guaranteed. Once that right was lost, um, it really galvanized particularly women. And I'm not just talking about Democratic women, I'm talking about independent women, Republican women, people sort of pulling me aside and saying like, look, I'm, I identify as pro-life and I could never personally have an abortion, but I've never walked in another woman's shoes. I wouldn't tell another woman how to live. And if you strip away all the political conversation about this and you just look at the human side of it, um, I think women especially understand that a full ban on abortion is just too black and white. It just does not work with real life. But where we're seeing it totally change the game is with our college age students. With Michigan State University, we have a huge effort to register voters and both the people who are showing up to, to be paid as a um, someone who's doing voter registration on campus, they're majority women. And the majority of people who are registering when we knock on their dorm doors are women. And it's, this is the motivating issue for a lot of people who, wouldn't, again, maybe wouldn't vote in a midterm. And that last part is a very key thing to remember because the student body of Michigan State University makes up a big chunk of Slotkin's constituents, thus giving younger voters a unique opportunity. We actually asked Slotkin if she thought that Michigan State students could ultimately determine the outcome of her race. Yeah, I don't even think that's a theoretical thing. That's just factual. Like the, the you know, we need, um, you know, anywhere between six and 10,000 more votes to come out of Michigan State and to vote on campus. But I I don't think without those Michigan State votes that I would be the winner on, on November 8th. And for both those younger voters and the rest of the district, Slotkin said that her opponent doesn't have the people's best interests at heart, especially when it comes to abortion. I think like past behavior is the best indicator of future behavior. So he has been, at to his own admission, very, very pro-life his whole life. Um, he supports the overturning of Roe v. Wade. He will not say that he believe in, believes in exceptions for women who have been raped or the victim of incest. Um, and then really what I watched was in the state legislature, he authored a bill to increase criminal penalties on doctors and women, right? Like it wasn't enough for him. This was years ago. It wasn't enough for him that, you know, abortion should be illegal, but like he really wants to criminalize it. Um, and to me, that's a person that if they are presented with a federal ban on abortion, which is a very real possibility if the Republicans flip the House, there are some adamant pro-life folks there who will put up a bill to ban abortion. I think he, you know, he won't he won't be pinned down on this issue, but you have to look at his past behavior that he would vote yes on a federal ban um, unless he says otherwise. But it's also important to remember that federal abortion rights aren't the only thing at play here, right? Slotkin also said that Barrett poses a very serious threat to election security and democracy for all Americans. Well, look, again, we've seen his actions. Michigan was one of those states where they they tried to say it wasn't a legit vote, even though Biden won by over 150,000 votes. He was summoned to the Oval Office by Donald Trump and he went. He um, authored or co-authored a letter um, that questioned the results of the 2020 election. And he said in one of our debates that he thought that debate and that back and forth um, leading up to January 6th was a good thing, right? It was a healthy thing for our country. Um, Congress does have the responsibility of certifying the election. That's why we had an armed insurrection in the Capitol because they were trying to stop that. The, you know, so um, I think, like to me, again, this is a person who has has shown through their behavior where they land on things. And if there was questioning of the election again, and even though every authority had said it was a legit election, I'm not sure how he would vote. Um, and whether he would certify an election. The results of 2022 absolutely set up 2024 and whether we're going to be able to, to have a democracy that, um, that survives by electing the person that the popular vote goes for. Also, something I really love from the Slotkin interview is something she kind of talked about regarding people that feel like their vote might not matter. When you're living through history, there seems like chaos. It's very easy to want to disengage. There's this point where she was talking about this 24, 25 year old woman that she was speaking to and she said this. I talked to so many young people who are just like, I hate politics. I, I, I talked to a woman yesterday and she was, uh, I knocked on her door, on her mom's door and she was in the background 
Um, she's like 24, 25 years old. I said, what about you? You know, your mom's, your mom's voting. Like, what about you? And she's like, I don't, I don't fuck with politics. And I said, okay, but politics can fuck with you. Right. And it's just a matter of time until some politician makes a decision that affects your life. And if choice isn't a, a glaring example, there are about 20 others um, that I can name for you. And so, you know, you may not like it, but the only way to make it better is to be engaged. And for me, it starts with who we're electing. It is easy to feel down and dark about the future of the country. And certainly, if I were 20 years old right now, looking at how a mess the politics are, how a mess so many policies are, um, I uh, certainly understand and get those dark moments myself. Um, but um, I think it's really important to look at history as uh, and put ourselves in context where we are at this moment. Um, we're going through a really, really difficult time in our history, but it's not the only really difficult time in our history. The average person um, in those moments did a few inches more than they were used to doing, and they got engaged and they started like taking it um, to the man. <laughs> And that's what got us through those moments. And then there were decent enough leaders to receive the ball and do something about it. So um, I, I believe in that. I believe in young people making massive change. That is our country's history. And I hope to be a one of those principled leaders that they deserve. And that's absolutely skyrocketing right now. For example, if we look to the UK first, there was a report that found that across 2021, one in three 16 to 25 year olds had tried drugs across the year, which was a 50% increase from previous highs. And around this, you had Vice speaking to a lot of young UK drug users, and a lot of the stories were very depressing. One young woman saying she abused ketamine to just numb everything for a while. Another saying she used K to help with the stress of adulthood, especially because she felt unprepared for adulthood after being in the lockdown for years. And it really looks like the impact of all of that, it's going to continue on for Four years. With in fact 23% of young Brits saying that they won't ever recover from the emotional impact of the pandemic. It's also led to the relative happiness and confidence of 16 to 25 year olds being the lowest that it's been in 13 years. Also, I think a key thing here would be to then continue conducting this study moving on because the logical reason for this is that COVID lockdown restrictions were starting to be lifted around this time. However, the report found that the primary reason that people were using these substances was to escape problems in their lives. And many of these problems are economic, they're fueled by the UK's recent decisions to leave the EU, alongside an energy crunch as Russian retaliation for supporting Ukraine. So you have that plus a bunch of other factors, including, I mean, there's been a huge spike in the cost of living with inflation hitting like 10.1% today. Also, the average cost to buy a home increased nearly twice as much as the average worker's wage over the last 50 years, which is, I mean, someone that tracks the California retail market, I can sympathize with. Like you see reports about celebrities buying like a $4 million home and you're like, oh yeah, that used to be $2 million two years ago. And as these numbers rise and rise and they go insane, like the hope to be able to actually ever own a home and have that stability, it, it goes away for more and more people every Every day. You know, speaking of California, one of the questions that pops up is, is it just the UK? Are we seeing something similar here in the US? And to that, I would say, you know, there wasn't really a one-to-one -one study, but it does appear that at the very least, there are similarities. With, for example, the National Institute of Drug Abuse finding that marijuana and hallucinogen use among young adults reached an all-time high in 2021. But also a uh, key thing here, uh, smoking a joint in your room, uh, doing mushrooms or doing K, not all the same thing. Plus, it's not even considering other hard drugs like cocaine, though. I, I feel like if I mentioned that cocaine is a hard drug to a lot of people in Los Angeles, they'd be like, no, it's not. But to me, that shit was always scary. And now, like, the percentage of, of fentanyl found in cocaine, like, how often that happens is fucking insane. And I do think that with, with, when we talk about drugs, we, we if we have long conversations, they do need to be nuanced. Or we can't treat all drugs the same. Like, when we talk about marijuana, it still boggles my mind that there are people that still treat that like it's a hard drug. Or if you talk about the opioid epidemic and that two different things. And I think it's a key thing to remember because while drug overdoses have increased in this country, the perception that drugs are an issue has gone down, which is why I think a huge part of moving forward to a better future, a safer future is having really honest discussions about drugs. Right? Because even with the main drugs that we talked about, right? Marijuana, uh, magic mushrooms, uh, ketamine. I'm not against all of those. I think there've been really interesting studies regarding uh, magic mushrooms with, with getting over depression and PTSD, right? But the main thing there, it's in a therapeutic and medical setting. Same thing with ketamine. There's a lot of really interesting, important studies that are coming out. And of course, those who have watched me for a long time know that I've been for marijuana legalization since it became a popular idea. But also on a personal note, in the, the past two months, I've actually quit 
all drugs. And even that makes this a story that I can relate to because like, man, during the pandemic lockdowns, like I, I couldn't go to sleep unless I had some weed at night. It became this every night habit. And I don't think it was anything like I was addicted. It just became like, this is the only way that I can fucking deal with the insanity that's happening during these two years. But recently, like I was feeling it in general, but also I, I was on a podcast that ha for someone else that hasn't aired yet. And during it, I was like, man, I'm having memory troubles. I'm not as quick as I used to be. Is it maybe because of this? Let me stop. And so far it's felt like, a really good choice. And at the very least, it was nice to show myself that I didn't actually need it. That it wasn't just saying I could stop at any time, that I could actually do it without like it being a thing. But hey, uh, this is YouTube. I can't promise any fucking place is a safe space. But I really am interested with this story about your, your thoughts on it in general. And also if you have any kind of like personal takeaways over uh, drug use in the last three years, if you would like to share it in the comments down below. This is a show, but we're also a community. Let's talk it out. And then here's what you need to know about gas prices and oil right now. So prices have been skyrocketing as the war in Ukraine continues and it certainly didn't help that OPEC and Russia, which together make major impacts on the oil market, decided to work together and cut production, which is what has led to using gas prices here in the US creeping up again since its extreme high earlier this year. With now all of this leading to the Biden administration announcing another release of crude oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve while also boosting domestic production. Right? And notably, that is a massive reserve of fuel that the country normally has for self-defense, but it's also flexible. It can be used as a way to relieve pressure at the pump. And if you're like, why am I getting deja vu? Why does this sound familiar? It's actually because the Biden administration has been releasing fuel from the SRP for a while now. It started last spring, and since then it's released nearly 180 million barrels of crude oil to address high gas prices. And this release is supposed to be the last one as the US doesn't want to dip below a certain level for the SRP, but there are rumors that the administration is open to releasing more in the wintertime if it's needed. Especially, remember this number, if crude oil ever dips to below $72 a barrel, with the administration having plans to buy a fuck ton of it to replenish supplies from West Texas Intermediate if that happens. Notably, there are also other plans to help fuel prices with the US and other Western countries planning to implement a price cap on Russian oil by early December. Now that said, Russia claims it won't sell oil under a price cap, but the US and other nations believe it's a bluff as Russia won't have many other options. And while it's not the most important thing, something to keep in mind is obviously that won't happen until after the midterm. But the administration is likely hoping that the news of this alongside the relief at the pump, it's gonna help them at the polls. Though, uh, based off of human nature, I don't think it will. I think the gas price situation is one of those things like you don't think about unless it gets worse. So I think this is more the administration trying to prevent a negative thing rather than getting points. Though that is also probably part of the reason why Democrats have been publicly on the warpath lately. Right? Hoping that some of the pressure on Dems will be relieved by blaming continued high prices on refiners. And it's also not a shock that so much thought is being put into this because for most Americans, the economy is by far their number one concern. And that is where that story in today's show ends. As always, thank you for watching, like, and being subscribed to my daily dives into the news here. You can also go to phillyd.tv and follow me on your platform of choice. Or if you want more news right here, I got you covered here and here. But as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.